Welcome to my talk, uh, using open telemetry for application security purposes. Um, in this presentation, we will discuss the evolution of application security and code vulnerabilities, how the shift to cloud native affected code vulnerabilities. We will see some examples and the way we used open telemetry in order to solve these problems that happened because of the shift to cloud native. Um, we have only 35 minutes, so let's jump into the details. Uh, I'll start with a short introduction about myself. So um, my name is Ron Vidal. I'm the co-founder and the CTO of Oxai Security. Um, in Oxai, we are building an application security platform for cloud native environments. So we are helping organizations to find vulnerabilities in their custom code for Kubernetes-based applications. Um, I've been around in cybersecurity and landscape for over a decade. Um, since I learned how to hack websites when I was 16 years old, built my first application security testing tools. And in my free time, I like to uh, look for new vulnerabilities and do security research. And in the past few years, I'm highly focused on the cloud native landscape. So a short overview of the agenda for this presentation. And like I said earlier, we'll start with reviewing the evolution of application vulnerabilities or code vulnerabilities, vulnerability in the code that is written within the organization. We will see some um, example of vulnerability that we found in cloud native project, in the CNCF project actually. We will do a short introduction about what is open telemetry and observability. Why do we need observability in order to understand our applications? And then we will be able to talk of, about how we can connect these two things together, application security and observability with open telemetry. And finally, we'll be able to see a live demo of a project, a cloud native vulnerable lab with open telemetry installed and how it helps us to understand code vulnerabilities much better. So let's start. Um, we'll start with reviewing what happened to code vulnerabilities in the, in the past few years. Because if we look on the shift that happened to applications, 15 years ago when we developed application, we used monolithic architecture. It all was a big chunk of code deployed on a server somewhere in the internet. But today, applications are distributed. They are built in microservices architecture. Now, so we went from local development, building monolithic application, into distributed application. And this, ch this change in the architecture also affected the way vulnerabilities look like. Now, why is that? Because in the end of the day, if we try to understand what is a code vulnerability, it's, it's a user input that comes from the user. It might be a query parameter in the HTTP request, and then it goes through different functions in the code base until it reaches the, one of the dangerous functions, such as communication with the database, command execution, or a deserialization uh, function. Now, in between the user input and the dangerous function, there is nothing that prevents the vulnerability, such as escaping or manipulation on the input that prevents the vulnerability to be executed. Now, when we worked in monolithic architecture, the user input and the dangerous function, both of them were on the same code base, on the same workload that is deployed somewhere in the internet. But today, when we shift it to microservices, it's no longer true. Because today, the user input can be in, on the external API, which is externally exposed to the internet, one pod, and then the user input can go through different third-party components, such as message queues, like Kafka or RabbitMQ, or even direct connection using gRPC, HTTP, and even files on the file system. Up to one of the internal services, internal microservices, and the dangerous function can be deployed over there. So now vulnerabilities are also distributed, such as the architecture of the application. Now, not only that, if we will look 15 years ago, the main factor that was used to prioritize the vulnerabilities was the code itself, because this is all we had. It was a vulnerability in the code. There wasn't any sp uh, special infrastructure involved in it. So we had to analyze only the code. But today, applications are much more complicated. Applications also use infrastructure as code. They use containers, Kubernetes, cloud provider. And this configuration have a huge effect on what a hacker is really able to do. The naive example is, let's assume that we found a vulnerability in one of the pods, one of the microservices. Does it expose to the internet? Is there any Kubernetes load balancer or ingress that make this vulnerable component, vulnerable pod, being externally exposed? But 
The most sophisticated examples is how is the permissions are configured for this pod. Maybe I found the log4shell vulnerability, one of the most popular vulnerabilities in the log4j package, but I found it on a container which is privileged or with a service account that is attached. So in fact, a hacker is not able to take only this specific pod or specific container. The hacker will be able to take over the entire Kubernetes cluster. So we have to take into account also the way the infrastructure is configured to understand the real risk of code vulnerabilities. So we've talked about two main things that changed. Now, first thing that we need to understand the way the microservices communicates one with another in order to understand the real risk. And in addition to that, we also have to understand the way the infrastructure is configured. Now, as part of our work, we're always trying to find vulnerabilities in cloud-native related project, in CNCF related project. And I would like to show you one vulnerability that we found in one of the CNCF project called Harbor. Harbor is a container registry. It was originally written by VMware. And one of the way to deploy Harbor is in microservice architecture. And as you can see here in the, in the architecture, we have two different services. The first one is user facing microservice, externally exposed. And the second one is a backend service, which is not exposed directly to the internet. Now, as you can see in the architecture, these two services are deployed using a different Golang version. Now, between these versions, the Golang team changed the way the Golang language parse query parameters in HTTP request, and we were able to use that in order to access internal images without any authentication data. So I want just to show you a quick video of the CV that we found. So as we can see here, we don't have any credentials to the Arbor instance. We are, not, we are unauthorized. And here we are putting a semicolon in the request, and we are using that in order to get access to the internal images without any credentials. Now, let's give it a second. Great, so we can see here, this is the blob that contains the image layers. Now, we didn't have any credentials that allowed us to access it, and yet we were able to get this information. Now, I don't want to get too much into the details about these vulnerabilities. If someone of you would like to read more, you can go to our blog post and read all of the details. We fixed this vulnerability together with VMware team. But I wanted to show it to express the potential risk in microservices architecture. And eventually getting access to internal image without any credential, this is something which is very, very dangerous. And the only way to understand this or to find this type of vulnerabilities is to understand service-to-service -service communication. Right? Great. So now that we understand what is the potential risk in microservices-based vulnerabilities or in cloud-native application and the way vulnerabilities look like in them, we'd like to discuss more about how we decided to resolve this issue, how we decided to prioritize smarter this finding and actually find this cloud-native vulnerabilities. So one of the ways uh, we decided to tackle this issue is using open telemetry. Open telemetry is one of the most popular projects in the CNCF. It's a very cool project. Um, and eventually, what is open telemetry? I will read it first, and then I will explain it. Open telemetry is a collection of tool, APIs, and SDK. Use it to instrument, generate, collect, and export telemetry data. Now, when I'm saying telemetry data, we are referring to metrics, logs, and traces. Traces eventually are the most important things for us. It's the most important thing for us because traces is the way the services communicate one with another. And open telemetry does that to help you and us to analyze your software's performance and behavior. Now, as you can see, security is not one of the, these things. We are talking about software's performance, software's behavior, and not vulnerability assessment. So, we couldn't use it out of the box, and we will touch shortly what we had to change in open telemetry in order to use it for AppSec purposes. But eventually, I'll try to like, explain one level up what is open telemetry. When we are talking about distributed systems, open telemetry helps us to understand the service to service communication. It's an SDK that you can write in your own code base, and then it instruments the different functions that responsible for the service to service communication. And then we get this data and we can see a visualization of the way the microservices communicated one with another. So we decided to use that because 
If we are talking about distributed vulnerabilities and we have a very powerful tool maintained by the CNCF that does the exact same thing, maybe we can leverage that to understand vulnerable flows or vulnerabilities across multiple microservices. So there are three main benefits that we got by using open telemetry. The first one is vulnerable flow analysis. So vulnerable flow, this is how we call vulnerabilities the stretch on multiple services. So if we have here, we can see in the diagram, we have a flow that starts on a Python API, and then the Python API communicates with RabbitMQ, and we have here an internal Java service that is not externally exposed directly. We can use open telemetry to understand that, and later on, we can use this information to know or to prioritize the vulnerabilities much better. So this is the first and the main benefit we got from open telemetry. The second thing, and it's also something which is very, very important, is vulnerability validation. One of the main pain points with vulnerability is that we get a huge list that in reality only 10% of them are really exploitable because this line of code is never being executed or this vulnerable package is never being loaded into the memory. So because open telemetry is a runtime solution, we can use that to provide much more accurate analysis. So we can look which functions are really being executed in runtime and use that to prioritize the vulnerabilities and reduce the amount of false positive. Because if I have a vulnerability that never being executed, I have to know about that, but it can be fixed later on in the process because it doesn't create a real risk for my organization at the moment. So this is the second benefit. The third benefit is the public exposure verification. If I have a vulnerability, and it can be a critical vulnerability, CVSS score 10 out of 10, but a hacker is not able to reach this vulnerability from the internet, once again, I have to know about it, but it can be fixed later on in the process because my organization is not in risk at the moment because no hacker out there is able to exploit it. And I can fix it tomorrow or fix the internet exploitable vulnerabilities before that. So these are the main benefits we got from using open telemetry in application security. But like everything in life, nothing comes easy. And we talked about it earlier, open telemetry wasn't designed for security, wasn't designed for AppSec purposes. And we had to change something in it in order to work for AppSec solution. And there are two main things that we had to change. We had two main challenges by using open telemetry out of the box for AppSec. The first thing, open telemetry doesn't collect lines of code. If I have a vulnerability in file called app.js, line 25, it can be a very critical vulnerability, a remote code execution, I need something that I can use to stitch it to the traces that I collected using open telemetry. And this something that I don't have currently is the line of code, because this is all the information I have. I know there is a remote code execution vulnerability, the file name is app.js, and the line number is 25. This is all. So we had, it, we, we had to add additional capability to open telemetry so every time a function is being executed, it also collects the line of code. It also collects the stack trace and the call stack. So this is the first thing that we had to change in open telemetry to work for AppSec. And the second thing, which is very, very important, eventually the original reason of open telemetry was to understand the way the services communicate one with another to provide flow tracing. It wasn't built for security. And therefore, we had to add additional layer of instrumentation, which is more security related. So the trace that we will collect will start on the API service, will go through the message queue up to the internal service, but it won't stop there. It will go up to the dangerous function that can trigger two vulnerabilities, such as command execution or deserialization function. Now, by doing these two things, I have enough information that can be used to, that I can use to stitch to my code vulnerabilities and understand the real risk of these vulnerabilities. So eventually, how everything uh, looked together. In this file, we can see that we start by finding the vulnerabilities using a static approach. So same as we do today, we are running static analysis tools, we are running SCA tools, and then we know that we have a list of potential vulnerabilities. I know that I might have a vulnerability in the internal microservice, it, the file name is main.py line 25. But by this point, I don't know yet if it's really exploitable from the internet or not. I only know this is a potential vulnerability. 
Now, the second step is to provide flow tracing to understand using open telemetry the service to service communication with these two changes that we talked about in the previous slide, including the security instrumentations and the call stacks. Now, the final thing we would like to look on the cloud infrastructure, on the Kubernetes configuration and the container definitions to provide even more accurate analysis to understand which microservices in the chain or in the trace are internet accessible and what is the permissions of each one of them. And after we did all of that, we can recalculate the severity and now focus on the most critical vulnerabilities and not only on the potential vulnerabilities that even if they have CVSS score 10 out of 10, they can be they can have less priority because they don't create any real risk on my organization at the moment. So this is an high level overview of the security funnel that we've built. So now after we understand what are the main challenges of finding vulnerabilities in cloud native environments, in Kubernetes based application, we also understand what is observability and open telemetry. And finally, we talked about how we can correlate between them together, between observability and AppSec now we can see a live demo of a cloud native environment with vulnerabilities, and we can see how open telemetry helps us to understand the real risk of the vulnerabilities in it. So the lab looks like that. Uh, the lab runs on a Kubernetes cluster in AWS, on an EKS cluster. It contains two microservices, two pods. They are both written in Python. We can see the first one, which is externally exposed through an ingress, also on the Kubernetes cluster. The external API gets use, get input from the users, from the internet, and then the external API sends the user input to the RabbitMQ, to the message queue, and the internal Python service gets the messages from the queue, and the message goes through this callback function. And if anyone can you, uh, of you can see the vulnerabilities in the callback function, uh, we can see here it gets the message in the body parameter in line 43, and then it's being it's going to the send mail function directly without any escaping in between, without any sanitation. So if a hacker is able to control the body parameter, the hacker will be, the hacker will be able to execute arbitrary code on this pod. But only by looking on this piece of code on main py file 43 until 46, we don't know if a hacker is able to control it or not, because this is just an internal service that is not externally exposed. So now let's move to our Kubernetes cluster. So as we can see here, we have here multiple pods. We have Jaeger all-in-one. Jaeger is the backend for open telemetry. We also have here two pods, the KubeCon external, the public Python API, and the KubeCon in internal, the internal Python API, the internal Python service that listens for the messages in the message queue, and we have multiple instances of RabbitMQ that are also stored, also running on this Kubernetes cluster. So now let's connect to our Jaeger UI. So this is the Jaeger UI. Let's look on the KubeCon external. And currently, we don't have any traces. We don't have any information about it. So let's create traffic into it. So I will get the address of the external API. We can see it here. And using a curl command, I will send an HTTP request. So I sent, I got back hello from KubeCon and Cloud Native Con Europe 2023. Let's go back to Jaeger UI. I'll click on find traces. And we can see here one trace with one span that contains only one microservice, the KubeCon external. I can expand it and I can see some more information regarding this span. But this one contains only one microservice. Now I will send another request to the API that will trigger cross service communication. So this time I will send a command to slash internal with a query param called data and I can send a hello and I got back 200 OK. Now, this HTTP request triggered the external API to write a message to the message queue, and then the internal uh, service got the message from the queue, and eventually it triggered the vulnerability we saw earlier. So let's go back to the Jaeger UI. Let's refresh this page. <coughs> 
And now we can see that we have an additional trace here. This trace contains four spans, but two services. We have here the KubeCon external and the KubeCon internal. Let's open it, and we can see the four spans. The first one is the slash internal. This is the HTTP request I sent using the curl command. After that, we can see here the message queue sent and the message queue received. But the last one, and this is the most important one, we can see here the POSIX system. It means that the OS system function we saw earlier was executed. So I will expand it, and we can see here some of the information we collected. So we have here the code. We can see here the execution. So it was sent with the hello as the parameter. The file name was main PY, and the line number was 45. So it means that we have a flow that starts on the external API, goes through the message queue to the internal service, and ends on this specific line of code. Now, in addition to that, if I will connect to one of the pods, for example, I will connect to the internal microservice, I will try to run a static analysis tool, one of the most popular Python static analyzers called Bandit, so I will install it. So now I will execute this Bandit, the static analyzer, on the main PY, and let's see if it finds the vulnerability. So we can see here that Bandit found a possible command injection vulnerability in a file called main PY line, 25, 20, line 48. Sorry. So it means they are completely identical. The information we got from OpenTelemetry that we saw in, in Jaeger is the exact same information we got from the SAS tool, the static analysis tool, so I can connect between these two. I can stitch be between them, and then I can use it to prioritize the vulnerabilities much better. Now, not only that, now I can, I, I can know that this flow runs on two services, the KubeCon external and the KubeCon internal. So it means that I can go to the Kubernetes configuration or the AWS configuration and look on each one of these services whether they are externally exposed or not. And as we saw earlier in the kubectl get services command, the external API has an external IP. So it means a hacker is able to send an HTTP request to this address, to the external address of the external API with a payload. The payload will go through the entire way from the external API, the RabbitMQ, to the internal service, and it will trigger the vulnerability we found using the static tool. So the risk is very, very high, and this organization needs to fix it quickly as possible. So this was an overview of a real-life example of the way we used OpenTelemetry for AppSec. And I thought to myself, what are the main key points that I would like to give from this presentation? So I thought about these four things. First of all, I believe that modern problems require modern solutions. And application security testing tools or tools that are trying to find vulnerabilities have been around for quite some time, I would say more than 20 years. Having said that, the way vulnerabilities look like changed. And these tools need to change as well. So if we are trying to find vulnerabilities in modern applications, we need to use modern tools. Oh, it's a very fine outlook. And the second thing I would like to add to the summary is that eventually when we are talking about the vulnerabilities in cloud-native applications, we must take into account all of the cloud-native information we can collect, such as traces and infrastructure configuration. The third thing I would like to highlight is open telemetry. OpenTelemetry wasn't built for security. It's an observability tool. Yet, if you can use it for application security purposes and it will help us to make our organization more secured, we should do that. And gen generally speaking, if there are any open source tools, it might be CNCF project tools or not CNCF, but I can use them and adjust them into my needs, this is something we should do. And the fourth and final thing is observability. Observ observability is crucial for us to understand what is the real risk for microservices-based applications, for Kubernetes-based application, we can't analyze each microservice separately without any knowledge about what's going on on top of it or under it, what's going on on the micro one microservice before it, on one infrastructure layer under it. We must know all of that when we are trying to understand or to make our applications more secured. So, Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm very happy that you joined my talk.
Um, I will be in KubeCon for the upcoming days, so if any one of you would like to grab a chat and talk about AppSec or observability or just CNCF security, CNCF security uh, in general, I'd be happy to do that. I'm also available in the CNCF Slack, uh, CNCF Slack. and I would add to that that in our daily job, we are always looking for vulnerabilities in CNCF projects. So if any one of you is interested with security research around CNCF project, feel free to browse to our blog post. We have released recently a vulnerability that we found in HashiCorp Vault. We also released a vulnerability we found in another CNCF project called Backstage. We got a CVSS score of 9.8 and some additional vulnerabilities in, uh, in Harbor. So feel free to browse and thank you very much.